So uh, before we go into this, I'd like to first thank the Herb Kelleher Center for Entrepreneurship, Renewal, and Growth and the Text Talks team uh, for helping us put, to get, put this together. Um, please check us out at www.techtalks.info for uh, more great talks such as these. So today we have Max Hoberman. Um, he's the founder and head of Certain Affinity. Um, which is a local video game developer with over 130 employees and has generated over $100 million in revenue. After graduating from UT as a photo photojournalism major, uh, Max went to work at Bungie as a video game developer on their Halo series. He eventually decided to start his own company and founded Certain Affinity as a bootstrap startup 10 years ago. Certain Affinity has worked on a half a dozen Halo and Call of Duty games and other major titles including Left 4 Dead and Doom. In his first 10 years, the company grew every year, turned a profit every year, and unlike other game companies, has never had a layoff. Now it's in its 11th year, it has raised $15 million to fuel growth and help transform the company to a lead developer and a creator of original IP. Please, uh, everybody, welcome Max. So, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, this discussion is going to be last an hour. Um, the first 45 minutes will be a, a question and answer panel with myself. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have 15 minutes to open it up to anyone uh, that has a question in the audience. So going into the talk now, yep. um, let's start at the beginning. So what was like life like growing up in a hippie commune? Yeah. So hello, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting. We, were, we chatted briefly beforehand, and I was uh, saying I'm, I'm not, uh, I pretend to be an Austin native, but uh, I'm actually not because I moved here in the, I think 1981, it's like five or six years old or something, and I moved here from a uh, hippie commune, which is sort of the uh, antithesis of, uh, I guess, capitalism and entrepreneurship at some level. So um, yeah, it, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting. The commune that I grew up on was in Tennessee, it was called The Farm. And it's the, one of the largest communes, probably the largest in uh, the US, probably ever, because I've done a lot of research on it. Had 1,400 people at its peak, so oh, it, was wow. a, it was an adventure. But a lot of kids around, there were half of them were kids, probably under the age of 10. So uh, yeah, it was fun, it was friendly, it was um, get probably, I probably inherited some progressive values from the uh, hippie commune, I imagine. <laughs> what does your family think of your capitalistic activities now? I, I think I got it from my family, I, okay. I think. I think that's part of why they left. Oh, okay. To, uh, I, remember, I remember my mom telling me she, her reason for leaving the commune coming to Austin is because she didn't want me to grow up poor and without shoes. So, <laughs> I, you know, in true story, I remember when I was probably four years old going, quote unquote, shoe shopping in the commune. And shoe shopping, they had their general store. And there was a giant bin right in the center of the room. And it had all these old used shoes. So you basically had to dig through them. You found one that was your size. And then you tried to find a match. That was shoe shopping. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So then you grew up in Austin for the most part yeah. um, after about six years old. But then you came to UT. Um, what did you end up studying at UT? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I grew up in Austin and you know, middle school, high school, all that. Um, I ended up, uh, so I wasn't actually sure. Uh, I didn't actually apply anywhere else for college because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, it's funny because. I w once I uh, got accepted to UT, or once I decided I was going to UT, I suppose, um, I actually realized that I wanted to become a 3D artist. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so I started looking around, and it, I, it was kind of frustrating because this was in 1993, I guess. And in all, I don't know today what it's like, but in all of UT at that point in time, there was one single 3D art class, and you had to be a fourth year art major to uh, get into it. So I, I quickly decided, all right, I'm not going that path. I don't really want to be an art major. Um, so I actually started, I thought I had this crazy idea that if I study advertising, there's an interesting path to writing and creativity and other things. And uh, I can somehow parlay that also into 3D graphics. So I actually started out as an advertising major. And uh, by the end of my first year, I was done. I was like, there's no way in hell that I'm going to be, Hopefully, I'm not offending any advertising <laughs> majors here. <laughs> but for me, at least, it, was, it wasn't for me. I was like, I, I can't sell something that I don't believe in. That's those hippie commune morals kicking in, right? <laughs> but I, I just can't promote something that I don't truly believe in. And I just knew it wasn't for me. So I looked around a little bit. And I just, on a whim, I decided, why not learn photography? I'm here. Might as well do something useful with my time. And I ended up actually becoming a photojournalism major. 
And then I, in four years, graduated from UT with a uh, degree in photojournalism, which apparently they don't offer anymore. Where's our photojournalist? Oh, there are journalists. Now you have to be a journalist. Back then, I was a specialist. <laughs> So what were your experiences at UT like as a student? Um, you know, how did you like the program you were in? Uh, you know, I, it feels weird to say it. Um, I wasn't the biggest fan of UT, oh. just, to, uh -oh. just to be honest. I know it's a little, well, I, got, I got to tell the truth, right? But uh, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I struggled to find things that I was really interested in at UT. Uh, it, it's weird to me now, we're talking about entrepreneurship and I'm a businessman and all that. Right. And talking to you know talking to you guys and grad students in business, all this stuff. I had zero interest in business. And my, my wife actually, she, we were dating at the time. She she got a minor in business at UT, and I never once in my time at UT did the thought of taking a business class actually cross my mind. Um, so yeah, I was uh, I was kind of looking because I wanted to be creative and I wanted to. At one point, I realized I wanted to make video games, and photography was neat. I think the. I seriously considered actually becoming a photojournalist, and the idea of becoming a photojournalist scratched some of my uh, social good itch, so to speak. Um, right. And then when I was graduating, I had a very, very difficult choice to make between sort of fork in the road, do I actually go on and become a photojournalist, or do I go make video games, which is kind of weird, I know. <laughs> so how did you... <laughs> make that choice to go into video games at that fork in the road. Yeah, so, so I, w I was genuinely torn about kind of which direction to go. And, and I remember I was, um, I was actually really good friends with the head of the photojournalism department at the time. And I remember very vividly, I remember going into his office and kind of laying out you know, my conundrum and talking to him and looking, asking him for his advice. You know, what, what direction do you think I should go in? And he, he genuinely helped like cinch it for me. Um, in an unexpected way, because what he told me is, he's like, look, you know, I think if you want, you can become a photojournalist. I think you'll be very successful. But I also, you also seem to have this knack for this other stuff and this talent. And he said, I'll tell you right now, if, if you become a photojournalist, remember, this is the head of, of the photojournalism department. If you become a photojournalist, you will die poor and unhappy. Why don't you go make video <laughs> games? <laughs> I, I swear or not, it, it was crazy. I was like, that's a very rational thinking. I like it. And that pretty much decided it. So <laughs> how did you develop an interest in video games? Where was the start? Oh, where does any kid develop an interest in video oh. games? No, I'm just kidding. It, it, fun, fundamentally, it wasn't that different. I got my first computer was, uh, this will age me, but my first computer was a Mac Plus. Mac is a, I don't know if you can call Mac anymore, an Apple machine for those of you that don't know back in the day, but uh, I got a Mac Plus and I was always a Mac guy, so um, I just grew up playing every game, you know, every Mac game that I could get my hands on. Um, you know, started out in black and white, you know, really, really primitive stuff. And I grew up playing games, I grew up playing a lot of multiplayer games, playing games with friends. You know, actually I was just, I just got in the mail today this uh, PDF, there's a guy who wrote this book, uh, The Secret History of Mac Gaming, and he had reached out to me. I ended up being one of his their sponsors. And it just oh, wow. published. I got the PDF of it today. It was fascinating because I'm going back through all the chapters, looking at it, and reading the history of all these games that I adored you know, and played growing up. And kind of, you know, you just don't know. You, know. you don't know who makes them. You don't know where they come from. And it was fascinating reading through this stuff. And then I got to the point in the book where I entered the stage. Oh. And then it was even more kind of weird and surreal. Um, so, but yeah, you know, I just grew up playing video games. I also grew up playing, you know, role-playing games, pen and paper, Dungeons and Dragons. I was pretty much always the one who would, sorry, always the one who would uh, run things, be the dungeon master, building a lot of things from scratch, building worlds, building systems. So I think it, was a, it wasn't that big of a leap to go from that to actually designing video games. And I had that thought in my head, I remember in college, that you know, there's a lot of things that make sense, but at the time I thought I want to be a game designer, and in the early mid 90s, game designer didn't exist. The only people that were making games for the most part were people who did everything. They were the programmer, sometimes they were the artists, they were, they were everything, but I was very specific. I want to be a game designer. I can't code or couldn't at the time. <laughs> so, uh, when I was doing research for this interview, I uh, came across that you really enjoyed playing Marathon. That, that was your first game that really got you into gaming. And I, I also grew up on the Mac. 
Um, and my parents never let me play marathon, so I'm very jealous. They, they said it was too violent. Too violent? Yes, yeah, so I was never allowed to play any first-person wow. shooters, and I had to play SimCity uh, like for 10 years, the same game. <laughs> that was it. Funny. So I'm very jealous of your stories. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah, Marathon Marathon was my first experience with a first-person shooter. Obviously, I've gone on to work on and make a lot of first-person shooters. Um, but yeah, you know, Marathon compared to compared to like Doom and you know other games at the time was was nothing. I mean, you're at least you weren't fighting humans, right? You're running around helping humans, fighting aliens, and rampant you, AI and all that stuff. So it was I wish a, you could have told my dad. You, that. you know, Marathon was a thinking man shooter. At least all of us Mac snobs at the time. That's how we thought of it. But, you know, <laughs> I, I remember I was uh, I remember going over to a friend's house and seeing at the same time I was playing Marathon. I remember seeing Wolfenstein 3D on. I don't know whether Windows 95 or whatever he was he was on back right, then, right. and uh, I remember dismissing it, thinking, "Oh, that's crap! Like it's so primitive." Because you know the reason why is because Marathon had vertical looking, and back there, Wolfenstein, your view was just fixed flat the whole exactly. time. So, I thought the Mac was you know leagues ahead of uh, you know who, who I thought that was the future of gaming. Who knew how ignorant I was? <laughs> So you went on to work for Bungie after school. Yep. Um, so what was your first role there? So I, I was, uh, let's say, when I graduated, I was uh, trying to figure out. I finally decided I wanted to get into video games. I was uh, trying to figure out where to go, and I was very idealistic. There was a very, very small set of companies I wanted to work at, um, or even knew about, honestly. Because um, at the time, the internet was in its infancy. You can just go online and you know, get, here's a list of all the game companies in town. So. Um, I wanted to work at Origin, which was actually here in town, because I was a huge fan of Ultima 3. I don't know if you remember Ultima 3, it had been ported to the Mac, and I loved it. It's one of the first single player games I ever finished, like the whole RPG right. that, that I ever finished. Um, I wanted to work at Blizzard, because I was a huge Warcraft 2 fan, mostly multiplayer. Um, and I wanted to work at Bungie, because yeah, you know, I grew up you know, in marathon LAN parties nonstop, right? Half of all the games I played were basically marathon, or half of all my gaming time was marathon. So I, I looked around and uh, I could not get the local guys, which was Origin, I could not get them to give me the time of day. Nothing I did, they would not give me the time of day. Mm. Um, to be so, fair, I was trying to get in as a 3D artist and I wasn't a very good 3D artist. Um, hadn't taken any classes, so <laughs> <laughs> and apparently wasn't very good at it. So um, I never actually applied at Blizzard because I saw a job posted at Bungie for, uh, the t job title, I remember it was graphic designer slash webmaster. Um, and it's funny, because at the time I had, th the web was in its infancy, and I had made exactly two websites. I had stayed home one spring break when everyone else went skiing or beach or somewhere, I don't remember. I had stayed home and decided I want to spend a week and learn how to make websites and made my own little portfolio site. And I only made one other website and, uh, but the thing is, back then, the internet was so primitive, the World Wide Web was so primitive, that pretty much qualified me to be webmaster. So I, I had no <laughs> doubts, like confidence. So uh, yeah, so I applied and that ended up, I got, I got hired at Bungie and I ended up doing all of their uh, graphic design, print design, web design, and all that quickly moved into community management, ran their uh, online gaming service. It was a small company, there were, there were like a dozen people there when wow, I started. I didn't realize it was uh, Tiny. So small. I yes. made t-shirts for the first time. I, <laughs> when I drove from Chicago down to Indianapolis to do a press check on the boxes for a big game, you know, oh, wow. Myth the Fallen Lords back then, a big game we were doing, just, you know, living the dream, but not on the development side. So it was a foot in the door. I told them, I, I did something that generally people advise you not to do. I have to, it's interesting, I'm not sure if I advise it or not. I have to think about it. But when they interviewed me, I, and they asked, what do you want to do long term? They're interviewing me for this job on their, their self-published on their publishing team, and obviously it was not a game development job. And I, my answer was straight. I was like, I want to be a game designer. <laughs> Which everybody tells you don't do that in a job interview. Say you know you want to do something in your this track at least. Um, apparently that didn't uh, dissuade them. They still they still made me an offer. Right. And then years later, I finally actually made the jump, became a full-fledged developer. But it took a lot of time, and I didn't even become a full-fledged developer till Halo Two after we'd all been acquired by Microsoft and moved out to Seattle and everything. So, that so leads, sorry, that's probably... Oh, no, that leads me into the next question. <laughs> so you became, eventually became a developer. How did you make that transition, first of all? That, that, I find that interesting because 
I, I think a lot of people, you know, when they first get their job out of college, they might not always enjoy it, but there's definitely a lot of opportunity even within one company. So to hear how you might make that transition would be definitely yeah. very interesting. You, you know, I was, uh, I was really stubborn and really consistent, and I, you know, I was good friends with both of the founders, both the owners of Bungie, and I never wavered over all those years in saying, one day I want to be a, I want to be a game designer. And at the same time, I also did my job, <laughs> right? I, there actually is interesting. There were lots of opportunities to sort of shirk my responsibilities, and there were plenty of need for game design, and I absolutely refused to do that. Like, I always did my job. I always did it really well, <coughs> but I didn't waver in saying I want to be a you know, game developer, and I dabbled a little bit. I ended up doing all the, doing the user interface design um, for the Myth 2 and then for, actually for Halo, um, later on, but it, that was just dabbling. That was like maybe 10% of my time. So I was, you know, I was in the mix a little bit, but I was never part of the core development team. It was never my primary responsibility. I, I was just really consistent and stubborn that that's what I, that's what I want long term. And then when Halo 2 came along, um, I there was a real schism on the team because the you, I'm sure you all know with Halo 1, the uh, LAN party multiplayer was. Hugely popular, absolutely. Um, but at the same time, what, what we had done with the multiplayer was not what the the development team had actually planned on doing, because they, they had these grand plans and they were going to revolutionize multiplayer and they wanted to do some things that were very different than what we actually shipped in the game. What we actually shipped in the game, we kind of just had to shoehorn in at the last minute. Um, I, it was really popular, which is good. Um, we knew what we were doing, and all that marathon instincts and solid systems foundation and everything allowed us to shoehorn something in, and we ended up you know, with arena deathmatch style multiplayer, but it took off on the console and LAN parties and everything, and it was huge. So right. going into Halo 2, there's this massive schism. Do we stay that path um, and just sort of build on what we have and advance it, or do we throw it away and go back to the big dreamy original stuff that the team wanted to do? I, I say schism, but it really wasn't a schism. The development team wanted to throw it all away and do something new, and I was a voice for saying, that's, that's insanity. Like, right. you know, like that's, just, that's just crazy. And I was very vocal about it. I felt like I was representing the community. I had founded the community team once we went to Microsoft, got acquired. And I felt like I was representing for the community and trying to represent here. This isn't what the community wants. If we can take Halo LAN party multiplayer and we can take it online and give people this same experience over the network, like that's going to be revolutionary. That's going to be off for console anyway. That's going to be awesome. Right. Um, and it was a huge schism. and. Ultimately, the path that I was promoting ended up being the path that we decided to take, you know, roundabout way. And then one day, the two founders of Bungie came to me and said, "Hey, so we know you always say you want to be a developer. So why don't, why don't basically why don't you do this? We're going to put you in charge." Like, oh crap! What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> so, what was your experience like working on Halo Two and Three then? As you became a developer, now you're a developer. How did you make sure you succeeded at the job? And you know, it was great. I just, uh, I just approached it the same way I always did, right? Just 100% commitment. And I, I think in a lot of ways, the development team was used to a lot more, uh, uh, how do you say this, a lot more of a lax environment. I, I was I'd coming off of years of like press deadlines and print deadlines and sort of hard, immovable deadlines. And you had to, you have to have everything buttoned up because you know, when you're going to the press check for the box, like I mentioned earlier, these things. Like, I'd come off years of just getting things done at quality on time, and I don't think the rest of the development team had that mentality. So when I went into it, I just did the same thing I always did. I'm like, I have exceptionally few resources, almost none, so there's really no room for error. So we have to get it right the first time. That means extensive planning, extensive testing, et cetera. So I just went in, we had uh, Halo 2, we had the multiplayer up and playable. Um, you know, within a matter of weeks, we were playing multiplayer games on a daily basis, testing our content. It was so funny because the very first, for those of you that know Halo 2 multiplayer, the very first map that we actually designed and had playable, to this day, for the Halo multiplayer series, is probably the top ranked Halo multiplayer map of all That's time. Impressive. Lockout, if anyone knows Lockout. That was actually the very first map. Anyone know Lockout? Test our audience real quick. <laughs> Go a little bit back here. A little bit over here too. That was the very first map we, we ever actually made, and it ended up you know being huge. So, you know, just quality, consistency on schedule. Meanwhile, the rest of the process project was falling apart. Um, but you know, the multiplayer and the online stuff was great. I ended up also being in charge of 
uh, everything online for Halo design-wise and you know, planning-wise. So the way that matchmaking works on the console these days and the party system and friends list and all these different things I ended up designing. And somehow, somehow I ended up, I didn't really know it. I think I knew it intuitively, but I found out that I'm actually a really good systems designer, kind of very technical focused, not a good programmer, but a very good technically focused systems designer when I have good programmers there to vet my work, kind of point out uh, oh, wow. errors. So it was, a, it was a good team effort in that sense. But yeah, who knew? I always said I want to be a designer and I felt like I'd be a good one. And eventually, first time up at bat and I hit a home run. So that was great. And going into Halo 3 was just more of the same, but bigger. This time I had more resources. I had to struggle with more management challenges and all this different stuff. Um, less of an island, more integrated with the dev team, which came with its own challenges. Right. So Halo 3 eventually led to your, the creation of Certain Affinity. Mm -hmm. So before we dive into Certain Affinity, I think it might be first great to touch on what Certain Affinity fully is and you know, kind of how did it start? Sure, yeah, so Certain Affinity, so we're a local Austin-based um, independent developer. We primarily do uh, first-person shooters, I would say 95% of what we've done. And from the get-go, we've insisted on only working on you know, top-tier, you know, sort of best-in-class games. Um, so I thank you for the lovely intro earlier, but you know, talked about working on half a dozen different Halo Call of Duty games, uh, working on Doom, Left 4 Dead, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I started the company back in the end of 2006 um, as a bootstrap startup here in Austin, and we've been going strong ever since. So we've been, yeah, 10, 10 11, we're in our 11th year now, I guess, and uh, we've, been, we've grown every year, we've been profitable every single year, um, <coughs> We've never had a layoff, like you said earlier. Right, right. We're debt free. A bunch of stuff that I'm sure interests those of you in the business we'll, entrepreneurship we'll get world. There. But we'll I know, get there. I know we'll get there. We'll right. get there. So, help uh, for those of us that don't really understand the video game industry. Could you kind of please break it down? Because uh, you you started by building map packs for Halo Two. Right. Yeah. So I'm 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 different. I, th I think a lot of this is I I think I, honestly I think I'm just a lot more practical. Um, than a lot of people in the game development world, or maybe my ambition is a little more, um, a little more in scope, <laughs> not out of scope, a little more reachable. So yeah, when I started the company, I didn't set out like most people do. You know, a month before I started Certain Affinity, there was a group, a couple ex Bungie guys, that was going around asking. I think I heard through the grapevine they were trying to raise like seventy million dollars to make a Halo killer. It was like three guys, oh, wow. and uh, and then I didn't really know the details, but I came along and. Uh, I was coming, you know, Halo was huge. Halo 3 wasn't out yet, but Halo 2 was big enough. And nobody knew, Bungie is such a silo, nobody in the, in the game industry knew anything about where did this come from and who are right. the players, you know, that were responsible for this. And then all of a sudden, here I come and I'm like, yeah, I was the multiplayer and online lead. And of course, multiplayer online were, you know, the biggest success story for Halo 2. So the, the, the nice thing about that is I was able to get my foot in the door anywhere, any level in the company, pretty much. Everywhere I kind of went knocking, so to speak. Any, I wanted to meet someone, I asked for an introduction from someone, and I met them. Because I, I didn't actually know anyone outside of Bungie except for ex-Bungie employees. How were you able to have this kind of access? Yeah, you know, it's, I, I just started reaching out. I had a couple contacts, um, and you know, I just, this, I, I guess LinkedIn today would be very, very valuable for this. It exactly. wasn't for me at that time. Um, LinkedIn, is, LinkedIn, by the way, is an incredible tool for networking. Exactly. But at the time, it was all connections. I just reached out. I still knew a few people. Like, for instance, we got hooked up with Activision, and the first uh, after the Halo work, we did Left 4 Dead, and then the first after that, the first Call of Duty, we did all the multiplayer for uh, Call of Duty: World at War. I got hooked up with Activision by a friend of mine here, one of the uh, sort of second, the first hire at Aspire, the second employee there, who I knew when I was in college. I just reached out to him, and he was working with them, and he just made an introduction. And like I said, because I was coming off of this great success and everybody wanted to know who's, who's you know, behind the curtain at Bungie, it just, you know, it was, it was a door opener um, for anybody and oh. just, you know, get on a plane. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, I know, I know the power. I'm very well aware of the power of LinkedIn for sure. Yeah. As yeah. a student, it's very important. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So early on though, you were asked to work with esports even, um, yet you turned it down, turned that opportunity down. Could you describe 
a little bit about that thought process and why you turned it down and maybe why you still currently don't work so much in <laughs> right. the esports arena. Yeah, yeah. esports, uh, I have a, have a bit of a relationship with esports because I, I kind of feel like a lot of the work that the multiplayer work, especially from Halo 2, absolutely. actually, was a lot of the foundation of a lot of, at least the FPS oh, yes, esports, right? right? We paid a ton of attention, but it always felt that way to me. Um, I remember those guys, you know, very, very early days, early on. And it, it was always a little bit odd for me because I felt like esports is this sort of professional, hyper-competitive type audience. And for that particular group, honestly, a lot of the people that were developers at Bungie probably kind of fit into that group. And they're hyper-competitive. And along with that, along with that hyper-competitiveness comes the sense that everything has to be perfectly fair. Um, as you all well know, that nothing is perfectly fair unless it's perfectly symmetric. Um, perfectly symmetric is not always as fun for design. And I mean, symmetric literally, figuratively, symmetric system design, symmetric level design, et cetera. So you know, what we had done in Halo 1 and what I experienced in Marathon and everything else was not designed for a competitive audience. It was asymmetric. It was more whimsical. And in, in a lot of ways, it really catered really well to a casually competitive audience mm, um, that, that weren't, you know, that weren't so concerned with this sort of perfect balance of skill and match of skill. And it's like, all right, so someone got a bad dice roll. Who cares? It's a bunch of friends in the dorm, right, or whatever. Right, right. So uh, there, was the, there was this big divide and a huge debate when I was inside Bungie about do we design for this kind of hyper-competitive crowd, which kind of nudges you towards this perfect symmetry in all things, or as close as you can get, or do we design for the more casually competitive crowd? And since I was in charge, I went casually competitive. See. So I, I always felt like with esports that I had kind of intentionally not designed for esports. So it was, it was always a little ironic that despite that, that you know, Halo 2 became this foundation for so much of the FPS esports world. Um, so, so I have that history, but I, you know, it, it all carried forward many years later because all the work that we've done at Certain Affinity and multiplayer was always for games that were not trying to be catering to that hyper-competitive crowd. They're much more mass market, much broader audience. And at one point I did have an opportunity, I mentioned this to you the other day, I had an opportunity to sort of pivot the company and turn our primary focus at Certain Affinity to really focus on catering to the esports crowd. And you know, it probably would have been a good opportunity financially, or it definitely would have been oh, yes. a good financial I'm opportunity, sure, sure I'll tell you that. But, but I wasn't passionate about it, and I didn't build a company full of people. I would say Bungie is actually, at the time, was much, much more geared towards that. I was the outlier than my, Certain Affinity is today. Certain Affinity is much more you know, designing for casual competitive. Um, so I, I just didn't feel it was right for our company. So it's, it's kind of a strange relationship that I have with esports. Um, not, not that I have any lack of respect for it. Um, you know, and it, I think it's awesome that they've been able right. to build a foundation off of uh, so much of my work, and in fact, the, the very first level that I actually, like, for Halo, put pen to paper and designed myself, got a little bit of help finishing it and fleshing it out, but the very first one I took pen to paper and designed, I didn't even know this. I found out years later, it was the number one single, like, most favored, preferred map of the esports crowd, oh, which wow. was midship, if anyone remembers that. Of course, it was symmetric, so right. go figure. Right? <laughs> That's actually the very first map that I took pen to paper and designed. I didn't, I didn't even know until like four or five years later how popular it was amongst that crowd. <laughs> so it's a, it's a strange relationship. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. So I think the, now the topic everybody is curious about is sure. you basically bootstrapped a company, and you have been very profitable over the course of your 10 years of existence. So First, I'd like to talk about how did you go about bootstrapping a, game, uh, a video game studio, especially since it's a very competitive industry. It's very difficult to be successful in it. And it seems like an industry, especially technology-based, so it's easy to scale, which means you know, you're primed for venture capital funding. Right. So you know, when I started, so I, I left about, I, can't, I moved back to Austin for family reasons uh, about a year and a half or something before we shipped. Uh, before we shipped Halo 3, uh, but I kept actually working at Bungie remote on Halo 3 up until nine months before we shipped. While I was doing that, um, I decided at one point, I, I was actually working down here, and I, I was in charge of everything still 
uh, multiplayer online, though most of remote, most of what I was doing was online functionality, um, really complex pain in the ass stuff. But uh, I, I was also, because I could, I, I was spun up a small team of contractors and I was do, working on a map pack for Halo 2. Right. Um, it's kind of fun and I thought maybe I could, I, uh, the honest reason, it's not because I wanted to start a company, it's because I didn't like working by myself. <laughs> I actually really enjoy working with other people. I didn't like working from home. In fact, I'm terrible at working from home. It's utterly unproductive. So I would, uh, I want to go in an office. I want to have other people and have fun. And so I you know, hired some contractors. I'll do a little map pack on the side. So I was doing that work and I realized along the way at one point, there's a real opportunity here to convert that into uh, the work for a new company. And I, and I kind of am in a position of strength because everyone wants this DLC that we're doing. Um, and I'm still on great terms with everyone. I'm still an employee, in fact. So I just decided I'm going to do this. And I went, I had to, I had to go to Microsoft through the uh, bureaucracy, and I had to get formal approval from their legal to enter into actual business negotiations with them while I was a full-time employee, because that's generally very frowned upon. Um, but I did. I, I eventually took some nudging. But, but I knew. I actually knew the head games attorney. So I remember he just sat on my request for like a month. Finally, I got irritated, and I picked up the phone, and I called him. It was like Don, I think. And I was like, hey, so what, what's going on with this request? I, you know, you're slowing me right. down here. And I remember him saying, he's like, this request is very unusual. I was like, yeah, yeah, go talk to these people. It's all good. It's all above board. So, so it worked out. And I actually negotiated my first deal to just take the work that we were doing and just do it as a contract, pick up where we left off, where we never left off, and just do it as a contract as my own company. And I got in this awesome situation. It was on Christmas Day um, of 2006, where I finally had the final contract ready for signature. Mm -hmm. I was still an employee, and it was all going to go through uh, e-signature. It's actually the only time done a dozen contracts with Microsoft. It's the only time they did one through e-signature. I don't know why. But uh, I found out that day that they wouldn't actually allow me to sign it while I was still employed. So I had to write a letter of resignation before they would allow me to <laughs> digitally sign. So the same day that I gave, handed in my resignation, I also signed my contract. And it actually got countersigned by Phil Spencer on Christmas Day. Oh, wow. He's now leading up you know, everything over there, Xbox and games. Oh, right. exactly. So it's so funny, because I started my own company, Bootstrap Startup, which um, was a combination of I had paying work from day one. Like I, we did not miss a beat. We just took everything we were doing. I worked in my deal that all the Microsoft, all the Microsoft hardware that we had would just, you know, sort of be on loan to the new company. We, we never missed a beat. We just kept going, and that doesn't mean it. I didn't have to put some money into the company. Exactly. So the bootstrap startup part. I think I started it. Uh, I put $80,000 into the company to seed it out of my own pocket. Um, it, it was funny because I remember I was telling my wife I wanted to start a company, and she was really insistent. So she went to business school. So she said, you have to have a business plan. It's like, oh, crap. Ooh. What's a business plan? So I literally went to Google, and I Googled business plan. <laughs> I'm like, what's a business plan? What do you, I don't know what you put in a business plan. I don't know if our <laughs> entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial yeah. growth professor would agree with that. <laughs> well, so I don't remember the details. Somehow I convinced her. I never had a real business plan, but somehow I got her comfortable with the idea. And she tells people to this day, I told him he had to have a good business plan, and he did. And I'm always scratching my head. It's like, I don't, I don't know if good is the right way I would describe it, but clearly I did something right. So. Um, I was able to, you know, never miss a beat. We had paying revenue coming in day one. I had enough money to fund it. I had done all my, tried to do all my projections on how much it would cost. I was incredibly frugal. But I think for the first three years of my own company, I never bought a single computer. Every wow. deal I did, I would negotiate that they would provide all of the hardware and software for us. All right. So, wow. you know, I was incredibly frugal. And still, I remember at peak, I, I still underestimated and at one point, my $80,000 was $110,000, which my wife is not happy about. My business plan wasn't, you know, I'd underestimate it wasn't exactly what I thought. Um, but it all worked out. And that's actually the most money I ever put in out of my own pocket. But I was incredibly frugal. So as, as an example, I had to figure out, what do I, what do I pay myself? A, and I'm seeding this thing, so it's kind of weird. What do you pay yourself? For the first, I think it was two years, what I decided to do is I'm going to match my salary to our lowest paid employee. Because wow. right? I got to pay myself something, but I don't want to overdo it. So you know, I was incredibly frugal. I negotiated for the first year with a bunch of people to take reduced salary in exchange for 
uh, what essentially is a phantom stock plan. So stock in a, if anyone's familiar with the phantom stock plan. How did this frugality come about? Like where did you learn these skills and it's, it's just it? good business sense. I mean, and I didn't learn it anywhere, right? It's just, right. Uh, it's just I don't. I want to be successful, and if I'm going to be successful, I can't run out of money. So how am I going to not run out of money? I'm not going to be wasteful. And I think some of it's also just inherent. I, I remember I would get very annoyed when I felt like even at Microsoft with its billions of dollars in cash, when I felt like other people that worked at Bungie were being wasteful and excessive, it would actually really bother me. I, just, I, didn't, th I didn't think that that was morally sound. I didn't think that's the way that you should run a business. So no, nobody taught me it. Right. Um, now, Bungie was that way, certainly. The, the founder of Bungie, everyone's nickname for him was Tightwad. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I wouldn't say I learned it from him, because uh, honestly, I would have been the exact same way. It's one of the reasons he and I got along so well. Right? It's, right. Just, it's just innate. I didn't really learn it from anyone. It's just innate, and it's logical, and it makes good business sense. And to this day, I am exceptionally careful um, with expenditures and waste and everything else. Not quite as frugal as I once was. A little bit of excess, <laughs> but not a lot. I think it's an interesting point that you said that you didn't really create a business plan. I think a lot of MBA students Shh, don't, or, don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, business school undergraduates are always taught create a business plan and then follow yeah. it to a T. But a lot of times that business plan creates this strict plan. And that plan is based on assumptions. Right. Uh, you know, and, and I don't think it's fair to say I, don't, I did not have a plan. I had a strategy, right? I, absolutely, I had a strategy. My strategy was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, do work for hire. I'm going to take on work for hire. First of all, I'm not actually going to start my company until I have a revenue source. And that's exactly what I did. Did not have a single day without it, right? So I'm not going to actually start my company until I have a revenue source. I had a luxury that I was employed and being paid a really good salary at that time, which was a little bit odd. But, and then second, my strategy was, I'm going to use this co-development work and work for hire um, at a profit margin, and I'm going to take those profits, um, sometimes slim, sometimes substantial. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to put them all back into the business. I'm not going to touch any of that money. I'm going to put it all back into the business, and I'm going to use that to grow our capital. Right? That will become our you know, investment fund, essentially, in the future, and our safety net, and our nest egg, and all of those things. And, and that was my strategy. And I had, a, I had a great deal of patience because I told everyone from the get-go, we're on a 10-year plan. And that, I remember when I went and I talked to all these big publishers, that was the big difference between the guys that had just come before me a month earlier that wanted to raise $70 million and make the next Halo. And then I walked in the room and I was like, I'm going to do co-development and work for hire, use those profits to fund original stuff. And I literally told them, and when we are 10 years old, we will be ready to make our big breakout you know, Halo-like game. Um, which is exactly what we're, what we're doing now, working on our own. We'll get to Again, that. Again, the next question. Working on our own stuff. So I, I just had a really slow, patient, careful plan. So I had a strategy, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, so now you just took in $15 million in funding. Um, after 10 years kind of bootstrapping everything yourself, now you're taking in $15 million funding, $5 million from a local investor, and then $10 million from a Chinese investor. Why? all of a sudden take the funding now? So, so the really simple answer is that my strategy worked, but not as effectively as I wanted. I we slowly built our nest egg, and then things would happen. Usually the thing that happened is we'd have a gap in between projects. And I didn't really, truly, properly account for the potential of a gap in between projects. If I, if I had worked continuously or close to it without ever having to so to foot the bill without revenue coming in, my strategy would have been perfect. I did not properly account for those gaps in between projects, though. And those gaps meant that the you know, profits that we were saving, that we were building, did not grow as quickly as I wanted. So you know, we did this for 10 years. You know, we did really well. We gave 10 years. We actually gave out profit sharing because we're profitable every year to our employees for 10 years, which is interesting because we're kind of eating into that capital that we're trying to build. But it was important to do that. So, as a result of that and some of the gaps in between projects, my, our profits and our savings did not grow as quickly as I wanted. So after 10 years, when we were looking at what are we going to do, we actually had, a, for us, a very sizable um, cash reserves. But we'd also learned a lot more about the, some of the challenges of our business model, the co-development work and work for hiring, and how brutal it can be 
when you have a big gap in between projects. And I knew that we really needed most, if not all, of that money as a safety net. And what I could actually tap into to use as capital and still feel like we had that, that financial safety net was really limited. And that, that really compelled us to go out and say, like, all right, this is a time we went 10 years without taking any investment whatsoever. Um, but you know, sure, maybe if we get lucky, we do this for another 10 years, maybe things will finally work out the way that we wanted if we get lucky, or it might kill us if, we're, if we get really unlucky, right? And we, and we had a couple of bad scares there too. Right. So it's like, we're not doing that anymore. We're gonna finally go out and we're gonna raise some capital. I, I've basically held on jealously guarded all of the equity of the company for 10 years now. Right. Um, and what's the point in that, right? You can have a large piece, what is it, of a small pie or a smaller piece exactly. of a larger pie. And we just made, did that calculus and um, determined, okay, you know what, this is the time, this is the time, we are ready for investment, the team's ready, we have the right people to tee up our own original IP and own game. And so now's the time, if we're not gonna do it now, when are we gonna do it? And doing it required going out there and raising capital. How did you find a Chinese investor? Let's see. So uh, it was funny because when we started talking about raising capital, the first thing everyone said, I'm sure many of you have heard this if you've tried, is, oh, there's no money in Austin. You can't, you can't raise capital in I've Austin. I've heard that from many entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, yes. at least at that scale, right? So it was very, right. everyone's very negative. Um, we thought, well, it's not going to stop us from trying, right? So we started looking around, and we started... We started looking, sort of casting this net. We started looking locally. We started looking around. But the way that we started was primarily we started. We figured, okay, everyone says we're not going to be able to raise money in Austin, so we need an advisor. We need to find a broker. We need to find someone who can actually help us um, connect us to people, uh, probably on the West Coast, you know, et cetera. So we started this. And my wife was laying this up, but she started this really, really diligent search for people, and, and that that search meant asking every banker that we knew, all the relationships we have, every one of them. We always take this leave no stone unturned attitude. We start getting leads, and we, we started getting leads on brokers, but we also got a couple people that were like, actually, you should talk to this guy. He's actually an investor, and I think he might be interested. Some of those were local, and, and we got far down that path, and we realized that we may be able to actually raise money, not even use a broker and raise money in Austin, but the amount is limited. We didn't think that we could raise more than five, maybe if we got really, really lucky, $10 million in Austin, more likely five. And the target we were trying to hit was actually $15 million. So I started looking around and you know, casting a little bit wider net through my own contacts. And I had a, a friend who, um, a Chinese friend who I had met back in 2010, I ended up reaching out to him at a GDC just to get coffee, get drinks. And it was incredibly fortuitous because um, I, I was thinking, okay, if we're going to raise money in the industry versus you know VC and that sort of thing, the most like most likely I'm going to have to go to Asia for it at that point in time. All right, so I'm going to have to go to Asia for it. I don't really have those connections. He's the most connected person that I know. So I was kind of thinking maybe he can help me out. So I sat down at a Chinese restaurant that he recommended, which was a little bit odd, but uh, I sat I sat down <laughs> with him um, and we chatted, and he told me he's like, hey. Uh, timing is perfect because I'm actually leaving my job and I'm going to be the CEO of this new company. So we started talking and he offered us a deal to actually make a game for him, um, separate from the original IP thing that we we're working on. And in addition to a game deal, he would also be our investor. So it was kind of a two-part deal. And nine months later, I closed that deal and made it happen. I see. That's amazing. So now you're using some of this funding to basically double your company's size. You bought a new building. Yes. <laughs> and now you're coming up with your own games. Yeah, that's the plan. Yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a huge pivot for the company, right? I mean, we, we're primed and we're ready for it, but that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean there's not tremendous risk involved. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't make anything a slam dunk. I'm, I'm living that every day right now, right? Like, we're, we're knee deep in it right now. So. Um, you, we're actually going from being a co-developer primarily to being the lead developer, but actually on two games. One of them, the one with the, the Chinese partner is funding, is actually licensed IP. We actually helped them. We made the connection to the license holder, oh, wow. which is great. And we're point on that relationship with the license holder. So we got that over here. And then we're doing this 
you know, bit ambitious for us, ambitious original IP game. Um, and yeah, it's it's scary. I mean, it's it's terrifying. <laughs> but you know, I'm also we're, you know, ten years we've been we've been waiting for this. This is our moment. Sorry, Amazing. I don't remember the question, but I'm very. Oh no, no, about this. I think you already went there. You already answered my <laughs> yeah. question. So, kind of moving into a more rapid fire round, uh, we'll have maybe a couple questions here before you switch into a uh, question and answer from the audience. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just trying to keep it a little bit lighter. Some of the questions. Okay. Yeah. So, what so did what, I have for breakfast that light? Yeah, not that <laughs> light. Um, so what books are you reading right now? Oh, God, books. Um, I, I am actually a huge fan of books, but when I'm, when I'm here in town and focused, it's really hard to get much done. So I usually read when I travel. So okay. fortunately, I was just traveling last week. I got a little bit in, but I also dabble. I'm usually reading two or three books at a time. So let's see. Right now, I'm right in the middle of two books. So one of them is um, actually... Uh, it's a book called Schismatrics or Schismatrix, Bruce Sterling. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but it's, um, it was written in, I think, 85. And he's actually an, an Austin native, I discovered. I was reading up on him. But it's one of the sort of seminal pieces of the sort of cyberpunk genre. But I like it because it's cyberpunk in space. So I'm, I'm right in the middle of that. And I actually would be further along, but I was so excited about something in it, I loaned it to one of my guys, and he hasn't given it back. Mildly annoying. <laughs> so, and then I'm also reading something I stumbled on. I, I saw a documentary or interview with a uh, a, a Japanese uh, illustrator. It was essentially some director making this manga film. Um, and I went, I went and I looked, and I this thing was uh, turned out it's this film on Netflix. And I was so impressed with this documentary. I watched it on Netflix. If anyone's heard of it, it's called Blame. Blame with an exclamation mark. And I, and I watched this thing, and I was blown away by it. Oh, wow. So I went back, and it's all based on this original manga. And these, there's like a dozen books, and like this thick. So I actually ordered a bunch of them, and I'm making my way through those. And it's just mind-bogglingly, is that a word? <laughs> it's incredibly good. It's, it's just it's this pillar of this creative imagination that I'm, I'm just floored by. So wow. I just last night ordered one more of the books just to st keep to them. I don't want to run out. <laughs> so that's my random readings right now. What about like your favorite book? What's your, do you have a favorite business or non-business book? Business or non-business book. The business part is easy. I don't have a favorite business book. And the reason, the reason why is because I've actually never read a book on business, ever. That's good to know. Now, this is, this is funny because it does not mean I don't own lots of books on business. <laughs> People give me books on business, and they say, you should read this. And I even have two or three that I've actually bought myself thinking, you should read this. But I have this gigantic backlog. I have a huge library. I have this huge backlog of stuff I'm actually excited to read about, oh, like yes. Blame and Schismatrics and all this stuff. And I just never seem to find time to get to the business stuff, which it's kind, of a, it's kind of a fault of mine. But favorites. You're asking about favorites. Uh, so, yes. so I've yet to find my favorite business book. I'm well, then still looking. Novice. We'll go to the non-business. Still searching. Right? Um, it's such a hard question because I, I love books and I love reading. And I, there's so much stuff I like. So I don't know if there's any, any favorite, but a couple of favorites maybe. I, I tend to, I, I have a strong, strong preference for um, essentially uh, historical books that read as if they're fiction. I see. So, so, I, so two that come to mind as an example is there's a book um, that's a biography of Genghis Khan uh, by a guy named Jack Weatherford. Okay. called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Oh, that's a great book. And it is, oh, it is fabulous. It is absolutely spectacular. I want to go back and read it again because I like it so much. And again, once I find a book I like, I loan it out to my people. So I know exactly who has it, and he hasn't given it back yet. So I need to get it back. <laughs> but it, it is, that, that thing is incredible. I recommend it for anyone. It, it, it's, you know, the, the perspective it gives you on, it's called Making of the Modern World for a reason, and on the impact that Genghis Khan had in shaking up the order of things through about half of the planet. It's, it's incredible. And it, but at the same time, it reads like a piece of fiction. And then another one, kind of in the same vein, is, it's an old book I stumbled on in a used bookstore in Chicago back in the 90s, which is actually a biography of um, Confucius, mm. Ma Master Kung, um, Kung Fu Tse. But uh, it, it just floored me. It's incredible. It opened up this whole world of interest in Chinese literature and Chinese history. I swear this book, it's a biography, but it reads like a piece of fiction. Um, so 
if anyone can find an old copy of uh, that, that would be quite impressive. I have an old worn copy. <laughs> uh, I can't remember the author's name. I'll, I'll find it if you need it. Nice. So, I might, I some, might, a couple of my favorites. Might have, uh, <laughs> have to talk to you about these yeah, yeah, after sure. this. Um, so that concludes our Q&A portion with me. Cool. Now I'd like to open it up to the audience if you guys have any questions. Please come up to the mics and feel free to ask uh, Max today. Oh. OK, we got, we got a taker. <laughs> so if I go to Target and pay 100 bucks for the games that you created, so how much of my $100 do gamers get? <laughs> how much? That's a good Oof. question. Uh, you, you mean get like us? How much do we get as a company? You, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer because it's case by case. And every deal we've ever done, is it, it's so different from one another. So. I'll give you an example. And there's some games where everything we've done, I, when I go into business negotiations, I always like to give them choices. <laughs> and I always tell them, I, I've kind of gotten into a routine now, and I tell them, it's like, you know, you can pay us this much money and sort of pay us up front, and that all of our profit is worked into there, and you get, you know, you're paying up front, but there's no risk that we're going to get any kind of royalty or anything on the back end. That's, this is our price, right? If we're not going to get any kind of royalty, and that's fine. It's a high price, so I'm not opposed to it. It's pr predictable for me. Or we can take on some of the risk by working at a lower price, but that has to be compensated by some of the potential for reward. You're asking me to gamble, right? Every dollar that you ask me to reduce my man month rate is usually in the gaming world how it goes by. Every dollar that you want me to essentially give you a discount, I got to have the possibility to make a minimum of $2 on that. It's kind of arbitrary, but that's what I tell them. So, and that ends up framing a discussion. Um, in the best case scenarios, sometimes it leads to potential that I can kind of right. double my money, so to speak, um, but with a cap. And then there's some scenarios where it's uncapped, and we turns out if things go way better than expected, we you know we actually do really well. We got a unexpected um, we got an unexpected deposit in our account the other day. Nobody saw it coming. It was. Uh, three quarters of a million dollars. And our head of finance said, I'm pretty sure they screwed up. I need to report it. I'm like, no, 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 hold on, <laughs> so, hold on. I I'm willing to bet that we stopped paying attention and we got royalties off of an old project that we did. So before you report that they made a mistake, she's like, I had it happen once. It was a terrible experience. I'm like, no, no, it's legit, trust me. So we went back, we looked, and sure enough, we had a huge royalty check coming in that we never even predicted because uh, things had done much better than predicted. So it's, it's kind of all over the map. It's hard to, it's hard to say. It's gonna, it depends on the project, right? And of course, they never let me say the specifics. <laughs> hey, Max, thanks for being here. You have sure. a great story. I uh, came up on the hardware side as you came up on the software side. Um, as you make this pivot and you're going to deliver an original game, you run the risk of, um, competing with the very folks that you're developing for. How are you going to ma manage that risk, and, and do you think it, it is a, a real risk to your revenues and your business? Second, sure. I think you talked about social impact or social cause. Of course, first shooter person games get a lot of cri criticisms. How do you reconcile that yourself? Um, yeah, sure. In um, the company? So as far as the risk and you kind of risk to our current customer base, uh, the, the real answer is that we're all in on it, and above board, right? We're all in on this and they know it. Um, we, we even show them what we're doing. We give them opportunities. Uh, it, it's kind of funny because the current customers, the back channel at least, will, will outright tell us that they won't sign to be the publisher for the original stuff we're doing because they're afraid that they might need our help on the things that we traditionally help them with and then we wouldn't be available and they'll be in an awkward position where they're competing with themselves internally. I've had that happen many times over the years. So we kind of take our current, you know, our, our client base as it exists for our co-development work. And most of them, the chances of actually working with them as the publisher for the original stuff we're doing is, is actually incredibly slim. And it's, a, it's an odd thing because I, I did not see that coming. I was like, we're going to do this great work. We're going to build this relationship. We're going to be a known quantity, a known factor, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, we will manage to parlay that into them being a publisher for our original game. I got completely blindsided by their unwillingness to do it. And they're, they're willing to take the risk that someone else will pick it up. Because for them, I imagine there's some upside in a weird 
way that someone might not pick it up, and we'll come back to them knocking, because we need work, right? So it's, it's tricky. If they pick it up, there's no risk that we'll be available, because someone doesn't pick it up. So it's, but it, it's strange, because it's all very above board. And I guess that comes with long-standing relationships. Um, so yeah, how, how do we manage that risk? We find new partners, and we have been very, very, very active looking at new partners. Um, and, and we're getting pretty far along with a couple of them too. So, but is it a risk? Absolutely. But you know, we're pivoting the company, so the majority of what we do will be original development. I am 100% committed to that. So we'll either be successful or it's going to put us out of business, which is not the type of thing that you'd hear coming from the guy who said 10 years before we'll be <laughs> ready to do this. But you know, eventually, you got to take a jump. You got to take a leap. It's right for me. It's right for our people. It's right for the company. And I believe we have a chance of pulling it off and being very, very successful. To the, the second uh, question, the, I think the, the impact of first person shooters in current climate, running around shooting guns and things like that. The, the thing that I can say on a personal level about that, the things that I enjoy um, creatively, the things that inspire me, the things I like, the things I grew up playing like Marathon, in, in large part, they're on this spectrum they're much, much further on the safe side. So for instance, the original first person shooter that we're doing right now, there's currently, and we're a year, year in on this, a little over a year, you're solely fighting monsters and alien creatures. You're actually never fighting other humans. And I, and I have a preference for that, and I like that. You remember Marathon back in the day was much, I mean, maybe you fought an errant Bob every once in a while, but uh, for the most part, you're fighting aliens, and you're fighting monsters and all that. And, and in general, I, that's my personal preference, it, but I think it, it happens to perhaps be a little bit more socially conscious and responsible. So I don't, I don't for the original stuff at least that we do, I don't worry too much about that. You know, there was, I'll, I'll be honest, even internally at the studio when we, we took on doing all the multiplayer for, the, for Doom, the kind of new Doom game, and there was some angst at the studio because it's very, blo it's very bloody, it's very violent, um, and it, you know, it's got all this, you know, monsters and hell and all this stuff. Um, fortunately, it's still monsters and demons, but the, the level of gore and all that is is really excessive. I, I would not say that type of game. That, that's we're kind of a family company. What I mean by that is more than half of, probably now, more than half of our employees have children under, under the age of ten, and for the most part, people want to make games that they can play, but also they can play with their family, especially when you do make do a lot of multiplayer, co-op, and multiplayer games. Um, so the original game that we're doing also is co-op. So it's much more friendly. It's not head-to-head. -head, it's much more family-friendly, those sorts of things. So it's a tricky balancing act, right? We, we get hired to make a shooter set in modern day, near future, World War II, those sorts of things. Um, we need to make sure that what we're signing up to do is treating the material respectfully as much as you can. And you know, all I can say is that's, that's not what we would do if, we, you know, if all the stars align. That's not what we would do with original work um, if I had my druthers. But I also have a business to run, so it's a tricky balancing act. Oh, okay. sorry, please. <laughs> you guys are too polite. <laughs> Hi, Max, thanks for being here. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Halo and Call of Duty franchises, so. Uh, huge first person shooter. Yeah. Um, I have kind of two questions. Uh, my first question was, where do you see video the video game industry as a whole headed? And I guess esports along with that, because you first person shooters and esports has mm -hmm. really uh, seemed to grow, seem to blow up in the past couple years. And also, um, I was wondering if you had any role models and or anyone you idolized as a kid, and why? Thank you. So, as far as where I see things going, I was. We were joking earlier, and I, I was, I, <laughs> was saying, question. is there anything I shouldn't ask? And a question. No, nothing bad about you saying, but I saw him as, I was telling, I was telling these guys that I don't, I don't generally, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman, and I'm very focused on, you know, business, and that's probably the majority of what I do these days, and has been for a long time. And at some level, I'm also a game designer and a game developer, and that's what I do, but I don't consider myself a futurist. And I was saying, you know, the one area is like, I'm not the best person you know, we, we talk, do you want to talk about the future of VR and AR and all these different things? I, in some ways, I don't think I'm the best person to ask. It's not, maybe that's naive as a <laughs> businessman. Um, that, that's, maybe that's just my unwillingness to go read a book about business sort of <laughs> kicking into. It's just I want to make games. I want to do what I do. 
sort of thing. But it doesn't mean I don't have opinions. But a caveat here, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask about these topics. Um, you know, there, there's some trends that are readily apparent. I think that, you know, for me, games as a um, games as a voyeuristic activity. Um, you know, there's an absolute trend in that, and a lot of esports kind of ties into that too. It's fun to watch other people, you know, play games, and it's not it's nothing that's new. When I was in my very first year at UT, um, I bought a game. If anyone remembers, Mist back in the day. It's our puzzle adventure with these beautiful 3D graphics. I bought Mist, and I played Mist in my dorm room right over here at Jester. Actually, <laughs> is Jester still here? Yes, I, it is. I played Mist in my dorm at Jester with like five people for hours just sitting watching me play. Right. So, so it's not a new phenomenon, but the internet and the advent of broadband and and services, you know, Twitch and all these things are making it much more prevalent. So, in a way, I see that trend continuing because it's always been there. It's always fun. You know, a lot of what Halo did is it kind of brought gaming, you know, in, into the living room. And the living room, a lot of times, is on display for everyone and the family and everything else. So, you know, th this is an extension of something that's always been there. And I, in a lot of ways, I think esports is the same way. Um, you know, it's fun to watch people, especially when people, you know, when you're dealing with reflex based games and skill and repetitive, you know, nuance and learning the secrets on the maps and all that. It's fun to watch someone who's better than you, most likely, and sometimes who's spectacularly good at the game. I mean, even as a developer, I still enjoy watching people who play the things I develop and are like, holy shit, I, I worked on this map for a year, and like in 20 minutes, they're, they know all the secrets and they're better than me. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, the population is this interesting bell curve. And, and I learned, once we went online, you learn very quickly with a large enough population base, it's like, even when you think you're to the right of the bell curve, you're skilled, you're talented. Oh, even when you think you're far to the right, somebody's way far <laughs> to the right. So in that sense, yeah, it's, it's great to watch people who have that kind of talent. So I, I think he'll continue to grow. I think he'll continue to get big. And I, I enjoy it. It's not you know, to design for eSports specifically isn't my thing, but I, I definitely enjoy it. I wouldn't mind throwing it in now and then. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Uh, who is, like, oh, oh. As a role models, yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't really know a lot in terms of people in the industry. I was absolutely a huge fan of Richard Garriott, though, um, just based on Ultima 3 alone. Uh, I, that, that game did, so, it was so clever from a design perspective. They did so much with so little. Um, and the, the nuance and the depth and everything else just blew my mind. Um, now it's funny, because. I would say if there was like a childhood idol, he was one of them. Um, the guys at Bungie were, um, especially Jason Jones, who was the lead designer. So, you know, with with Jason, I ended up going and working for him, and for many years, essentially, you know, him mentoring me and talking. I'd go to his house and we'd talk for hours about game design, which was awesome because he's a childhood idol. He made Marathon, right? Right, right. So, and, and Myth, which I love too. So, and then now in later years, I actually become friends with Richard Garriott, which is. For me, is is just I've told him this, but it's just it's just kind of crazy, right? It, you know, growing up with childhood idol, um, super nice guys, both of them. So, those are probably in the game development world. Those are the two big ones. Which, for me, that might be the only ones. <laughs> so, All right. I'd like to limit it to one more question, um, and right. any any other questions? Maybe uh, Max will stay for a little bit, and yeah. if you have some. Time. Yeah, sure. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, what is something that you know now that you wish you knew when you started your business? Ooh, we're going to end on a hard one. What's something that I know? <laughs> something I know now that I that I wish I had known. Um, I'm not I'm not pausing because it's hard to think of something. I'm pausing to try and just pick one. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I I, I have been very successful um, despite making countless blunders and making lots and lots and lots of mistakes. So, so it's, hard, it's hard to single out one, but just to, just to try and focus on one. I think, that, I think that when I started, I really didn't have the business experience. You know, I'd worked at Bungie as an independent company. I worked directly for Alex for years, Seropian, who was leading the company. And it's sort of by osmosis and exposure and all that. I had some of that experience. But when I, got, when I started my own company and I got to the areas that I didn't have that explicit experience in. Um, an example of that being business development, going out there and actually sealing the deals and negotiating the business deals and these sorts of things. I, I had a lot of self-doubt about my own knowledge and capabilities. And, so, and honestly, not just self-doubt, but just 
lack of information and very little access to helpful resources. So you know, I remember you know, I negotiated a royalty deal, and I actually had no clue whether I had gotten a great deal or I had been completely fleeced. I had no <laughs> points of reference. right? So what, what that led to was self-doubt. And I went out, and I, I got help, and I hired someone who I thought had the experience to help me, and that didn't pan out. And then later on, I hired an agency to help me, and that didn't pan out. And over time, I realized that I'm actually a hell of a lot better at this than I ever gave myself credit for. Um, I started doing it myself, and my life would have been a hell of a lot easier if I had actually not had that moment of self-doubt. It's like, it, honestly, at the end of the day, it didn't matter whether I'd gotten fleeced or I'd gotten a great deal, because that's all relative to other people. All that really mattered is, did I get a deal that works for me, that forwards my goals, that, you know, that, that gets things done for me? It doesn't matter what the guy down the street, what kind of deal he got. Um, so I, you know, I think in hindsight, I, I learned some valuable lessons, and I try and take that to heart. Nice. That's amazing. Um, thank you very much for coming in. I thought it was a very great and interesting talk. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Please join. Thank you.